Hello, my name is Matthew Teasdale, and the title of my talk is Reading Beneath the Lines, Parchment as a Sheep Genetic Resource. Um, this talk will outline some of the work I've been doing in the past few years, um, looking at how we can use sheep parchment as a genetic resource and buy a bank of information through time. And when you think of partial manuscripts, you might think of something like this. So this is um, an illuminated manuscript. It's part of the Lindisfarne Gospels, which is held at the British Library. And um, as you can see, it's highly decorated, um, it's gilded. Um, it's a, an important religious document um, that's used in religious ceremonies. Unfortunately for this um, conference, it's written on calf skin, not sheep skin. But luckily for us, um, the majority of the sheep the parchment documents in the UK are written on sheep. Um, legal documents in the UK tend to be used written on sheepskin. Um, this seems to be, um, was preferred to other skins because of its um, ability to be um, less easily modified once you'd written it. So it had some sort of, uh, well, it was hypothesized to have some level of fraud protection built in. So you can less easily um, change text on sheep than you can on other um, manuscript mediums, for example, calf and goat. Um, so the, in, in the picture, you can see Chris Webb, who was, until he retired, um, the keeper of the archives at the Borthwick Institute for Archives at the University of York. And he was instrumental in sort of helping us start this parchment analysis. And as you can see behind Chris, there's a load of storage boxes and each, the, each in each of these boxes are a number of parchments. So if we can think of, um, these boxes contain flat parchments that store maybe 50, 60, 70 parchments on top of each other. And you can see there's numerous boxes um, in each of these bays. And then there's multiple bays in each of these temperature controlled units. And then there's multiple of these temperature controlled units in the archive. So if you think about um, each document um, representing one animal skin, um, you can see how the vast amount of information we have um, of sheep parchment documents in the UK. So um, this just goes to show how um, interesting this is as a source of genetic information and how many animals are preserved within documents. Um, and the new keeper of the archives, you can just see putting some documents away around the corner. So um, this is just to give you an idea of how much um, parchment there is available in the UK in particular um, and how this could be used to understand how um, British and UK sheep breeds have changed through time. Um, so to give you an, a look at some of the documents, um, so these are two documents from the Borthwick Archives, um, one from 1416 and one from 1777. Um, so the nice thing for my work, where I'm interested in looking at how sheep genetics has changed through time, is you can quite easily date documents. So some documents have been labelled with a date, other documents um, you have to read the text to see um, which king or queen is and in which year of their reign is, is documented and then you can use that to work out the date of the document and that tends to be we think that is quite accurate to um, the actual date of when the parchment was produced um, so we're hoping that this direct dating is, is would be informative and useful for how we can use these parchments and um, to understand um, animal genetics through time and this obviously this resolution is much higher um, presently than say carbon dating of medieval specimens it might have um, a plus or minus of say 100 years. So parchment seems to be a very well um, um, dated medium that we can use for this genetic analysis. Um, and like we said previously, um, there's maybe well in excess of a million documents in the UK alone. And we measure this by the, the shell. We, we can tell there's a lot of documents because the documents, the, the amount is actually measured by the meters of shelving um, and not individual documents. So it's becoming a problem in the UK um, in some sort of legal firms that are keeping these documents because they are of legal importance that they have so much material that some is getting lost because they've either been digitized and got um, thrown out um, or they've been kept in archives and archives are struggling with the amount of, um, sort of sample there is. So just to say that there's a lot um, of material out there, there's a lot of animal skins in the partial record in the UK. Um, this gives you an idea of what condition the, the documents are in. So in this case, you can see um, they're both nice and clean documents that they've, they've been well preserved, well looked after because of this sort of legal importance. Um, and they've been well looked after until they got into the archive. And then obviously the archive uses temperature controlled units and um, important like high, um, high tech housing to make sure that the, the documents are kept nice. Um, so the DNA is obviously being well preserved um, at the minute. And also because the documents tended to be stored in cold places, um, through time, um, it, we hope that that's also helped preserve DNA in the documents as well. Um, and this sort of this level of genetic information and animal information, um, when Matthew was invited um, to the Borthwick, that's what he noticed. I suppose that everyone was looking at the high tech storage solution, so that the sort of the temperature controlled rooms. But Matthew was thinking about the racks and racks of um, animal skins that there were to analyze. So between Matthew and Chris, the, um, this is how they sort of 
business um, analysis started thinking together how we could use these documents um, as not only a store of textual information but also a store of biological information. And it, this led to the term um, or the, 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 the study that we have termed biocode ecology. So um, we term biocode ecology, code ecology is the study of manuscripts and biocode ecology is obviously the biological study of manuscripts. Um, and we sort of take this to be the biometrical information that forms part of the biological history of the manuscript. So this sort of forms multiple parts. Um, the sort of three in strands that we are sort of interested in are the DNA of the documents and the proteins that can either be the protein that's in the parchment itself or, or say something that was used on top of the parchment and um, some sort of was added additionally um, and also the microbes that inhabit the parchment as well. So in this talk I'm concentrating on the DNA um, but another postdoc on our project B2C project is looking at the proteins and documents and then we both have an interest in the microbes. Um, the microbes is interesting also for the conservation of the document because it's interesting to know um, what microbes might be living on the parchment at, at the minute and how would that affect its preservation. So it's something we like to look at in sort of collaboration with the conservators is how we can use the genetic information not only as a sort of a source of information for us but how it can be used to preserve the document and um, um, keep the document going I suppose, how we, can, how we can give back to the preservation of the manuscript as well. Um, and then other groups um, look at the pigment as well to see what the pigments are made out of. This is important as well for our work because some pigments um, can have um, compounds that can degrade the parchment. So if you know you have a pigment that might be damaging to the parchment, you can sort of stabilize it and make sure that the, the parchment underneath isn't degraded. And that also helps us maintain this um, genetic source, I suppose, through time. Um, and this is just also to say that um, parchment, you can think of it as a sort of two strands of analyses in the genetic analyses, I suppose. Um, you can take, think of the legal documents that were in the previous slides um, as sort of time slices through time. So you could take a legal document, say every 50 years, every 100 years, and see how animal use has changed through that particular period and that particular um, region through time. Or you can look at these complete books um, where we have multiple animals from the same they could be from the same herd, but they're certainly from the same time period. So it gives you a snapshot of what animals look like at that particular point. So it could tell you something about herd sizes in the past, but also how uh, sort of effective population sizes maybe have changed through time. So parchment is sort of an interesting biological source because it has these two sort of strands to it. You can say um, the whole book analysis, but also um, sort of time slice longitudinal studies as well. Um, and just to say that um, if you're thinking about it in the DNA terms, that making a parchment is actually um, a little concerning um, because lime and water are used when you make parchment. So this is a riddle from an old English book of poetry. Um, and this is also just to make the point that parchment making was a widespread um, uh, industry at that time. So mo many people could read this, um, this, could know this poem and know what they were talking about um, parchment making. So this riddle was worked out quite easily. Um, and just to say that to make parchment, you can see in these documents, you um, what, um, dunk the skins in water and lime, you stretch them, you scrape them, you put them on a board, um, and then you sort of write on them. Um, you then it becomes the writing material that you write on, as is as, um, said in the riddle. Um, and also to say the parchment is quite a robust medium. Um, unlike paper that can degrade quite rapidly, parchment tends to be um, very well robust to sort of storage. And like I said, all these Parchments tend to be legal documents or important information that people have wanted to keep, the ones we have today anyway. So they've been well looked after through time. Um, and also now today, obviously, they're stored in high-tech archives that are looking after them incredibly well with um, moisture control and humidity control and temperature control. Um, and it's just to say that also parchments tend to be um, very robust to fire, so it's hard to, for them to be lost to fire, but they are very susceptible to water. So as long as you keep um, parchments dry, they tend to survive for a long time. And this is just what Douglas Hyde was saying in his survey in the virus literature that um, if you drown the books that tends to be more damaging to them than fire. So this is why we have such a large collection of manuscripts to the day because um, people have looked after them well and we've kept them dry I suppose um, not to and then look so this is just to say that the yeah, parchment is a um, relatively robust medium and it preserves well through time so um, you can get and it's illuminated manuscripts all the way from the 800s um, and they preserve pretty well to the modern day. So this is a good biobank to look at um, through time because it doesn't seem to degrade too much. Um, so you're not sort of seeing a lot of documents, um, getting a lot of DNA from the early doc the later documents and not much from the earlier documents. Um, and this is sort of follows on to my sort of 
um, parchment, the DNA from parchment can sort of fits inside nicely in the ancient DNA umbrella, I suppose. Um, and I take a sort of a, a broader definition of what ancient DNA is, which is any degraded DNA obtained from specimens not deliberately preserved in genetic analysis. So I think given how parchment is made with liming and water and is definitely not, um, the parchment makers weren't thinking about DNA um, analyses later on when they were making parchment, but they have preserved um, enough DNA that we can do something about it. So in my mind, parchment falls nicely in this definition of, um, this sort of broad definition of ancient DNA. And um, given the new the sort of the new technologies that have been available in the last sort of 10 years or so with NGS, and this has opened up a new sort of window into parchment analysis. So the studies that have done by our group, we were looking at, um, could we actually do NGS on parchment? So our early work was looking at seeing, is parchment a good um, test case, which we'll go through this study in more detail in the next slides. But also we were trying to have a go at this sort of complete book analysis as well. So if you take a single document, what, inf what genetic information you can get from it. And this, the Art Gospel is mainly written on carp. So we were looking at, can we recover cattle genomes um, from a single document and how do they relate to each other but also we were interested in the microbiome as they're saying as other groups are as well um, this group here is also interested in um, looking at how the microbiome is in these documents and how does it affect the preservation but also can you do interesting things like um, um, if you have a document that's been split or you have a, a tag that maybe came from a document and it's made of parchment, can you piece documents back together again? And this sort of feeds in nicely to this nice, exciting study um, of the Dead Sea Scrolls that was published this year, um, where they looked at um, piecing the scrolls together, but also they got a lot of sheep genetic information from the, the documents as well, as well as some microbiome as well. So it seems the field is, is picking up pace in the last five years or so, and there's a lot of um, interest in applying NGS to parchment and these new exciting studies are coming out, um, like the one on the Dead Sea Scrolls um, this year. Um, yeah, so this is just to say, um, our original study was a pilot looking at how we could use parchment, and um, was parchment amenable to um, genetic analysis? So I'll go through that one now. So in the Borthwick Institute for the Archives, they have um, a box of samples where the parchment itself is too degraded to be used um, in their collection. Either the parchment is too damaged so it couldn't be handled by readers or the text is so degraded that readers can't actually get the information off it. So um, the conservators only have so much time to maintain these documents and conserve them. So some unfortunately can't be conserved enough to become part of the main collection um, but they become part of this sort of samples collection that they use for um, practicing conservation techniques and um, also, it's a useful source for samples for us. So we were given some samples from this box um, of parchments, like off-cut parchments, I suppose. Um, and we used this for our first study. So it was a nice resource to have because um, the more important parchments and obviously the, the sort of the, the legal documents and things, we can't really sample that much. And the conservatives aren't that keen on that much sampling. So having these two documents where we could um, try a full range of techniques was really important. Um, so we got two samples, one from the 18th century and one from the 17th century, and we set about trying to extract DNA from them. So um, it's really fairly straightforward to get DNA from parchment. All you really have to do is heat it a bit um, and then add some proteinase K, um, which degrades the collagen and then liberates DNA. Um, so we tend to just do a very straightforward DNA extraction using sort of standard buffers, um, then stick that all into a chitin column um, to generate to sort of dissolve and get the DNA. And then we tend to use the Maya single double-stranded library prep. So that's one that's regularly used in ancient DNA and seems to work very well with parchment. So um, we use the blunt end adapter ligated one, um, and that seems to work nicely with parchment. And we generate enough. Um, information from that, so the libraries from that are good, and um, that we can then send to NGS sequencing. So parchment itself is quite a tractable medium for this molecular biology. You don't have to do anything that's, that's too um, expensive or clever. We can just do a simple DNA extraction from parchment, um, put it through a chitin column, and then use um, a sort of a standard ancient DNA method and then sequence on the house. So that's what we did with these two parchments. Um, the thing to say is obviously this is our initial analysis, so we use quite a bit of parchment in this analysis. We've been able to dramatically reduce the amount of parchment we need to use in subsequent analyses. Um, and the two analyses we really did was looking at um, how can we recover um, unique species da data. So one of the issues with parchment work prior was the suggestion that maybe because of glues or sheets touching each other or different things in the parchment 
conservation process, um, you might see a mixed signal of multiple individuals and multiple species. Um, what we found was we could clearly see that there was a single animal for each sample and it was sheep, which was nice. Um, so that was a, a nice result from this analysis. And then we looked at seeing how good the DNA retrieval was. So in this table below, you can see um, a percentage of aligned reads, which is the endogenous percentage of these samples, which is kind of the currency um, for ancient DNA. And you can see in these samples, we were able to recover um, about 66.4% well, of the sequ um, sequences were from sheep, and in the later one, 45.7% was from sheep. Um, and this sort of looks similar to the documents where the, the 17th century documents seem to be a bit more um, preserved a bit better than the 18th century one. And then when we do some filtering for mapping quality, etc., that drops down, but still it's a decent recovery for this kind of archaeological material. And then what we did was say, can we sort of genetically postcode these documents? So do they, do the genetics of the document resemble where the manuscripts were produced? And can we see anything interesting um, between the two time points? So um, these interpolated maps are um, of genetic distance of our parchment sample from modern day hat map breeds. So in this case, um, the positions of the black dots are from Kaijus 2012. Warm colors are more closely resembling the parchment. Cooler colors are more distant from the parchment. So as you can see in our early parchment, it seems to be localized towards the north of England and Scotland, where our second parchment seems to be localizing towards the Midlands and Ireland. So this we reinterpreted to suggest that maybe what we're seeing in the second parchment is an influx of say Leicester genetics or some um, sudden uh, you, sudden British genet sheep genetics into parchment um, that we found in um, York. So is it that they're moving animals around or um, is other things happening? So with two parchments, we couldn't really say that much. Um, but we got this sort of intriguing picture of change through time, which is what is sort of driving our, our future work now. So that was just to say that Parchman was sort of sort of opened this um, analysis up and said, yes, we can do this. And then we got interested in saying, what can we say more with um, more samples? However, we ran into a bit of a roadblock with this um, in the fact that um, conservators really don't like you cutting bits off parchment. Um, so we had to come up with a way of sampling parchment that was more uh, amenable to conservation. In this case, what we did um, um, was um, we tried, I mean, anyway, this sort of analysis was, was led by Sarah Fiddeman, who is another postdoc analysis. And what she did, she was embedded um, with the conservators um, and she was following them around the conservation studio and seeing what they did and how they performed their work. And what she noticed was um, what they were doing was um, when they needed to clean the document, they were cleaning it with this eraser, um, using these eraser small Stedler plastic eraser. It has to be more Stedler because that's the one they use um, uh, in conservation because it leads less um, damage to the surface of the parchment. So this is the one that the conservators use. So this is the one we use in our analysis. And what she found was if she took their waste, so this is the waste from the cleaning. So as they're cleaning the document, they generate these eraser crumbs, which she captured and then used for mass spec. Um, and she was able to get sufficient um, information from these crumbs to get a, de a good species ID that was comparable to a cut piece from the same parchment. So she was happy with this analysis for her proteomics work and she wondered whether um, we could do the same for DNA. So we set up these side-by-side -side comparisons using these three documents looking at a cut piece but also an eraser rubbing and again it's the endogenous percentage so the amount of in this case cow and sheep sequences we could get um, from the different parchments, some are cow and some are sheep. And what we found was generally um, the eraser is a little bit worse than cut pieces, but by no means um, terrible. And in one case, we got more data from the eraser than we did from the cut piece. And um, so this gave us confidence that we could then use this to sample documents that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to sample. So um, cut pieces tend to be best. So if you can get a cut piece from parchment, that tends to be the best sample to use. But obviously, a lot of documents are unavailable if you want to cut bits off them. So the eraser technique, because it is standard conservation practice, has opened up a new sort of level of analyses we can do. And um, even though it tends the data quality is not as good as cut pieces, we get more samples. So we can sort of pick and choose a bit better. Um, and this sort of led us to this sort of level of analysis. So now, because we know we've been doing this for quite a while, we know how much of razor crumbs we need kind of for different analyses. So for protein, you don't need that much at all. You only need 1.5 mil. Um, sorry, you only need very a more small amount in these 1.5 mil centrifuge tubes. And um, for DNA, you probably need about 250 microliters of rubbings. And for metagenomes and microbiomes, you can get away with about half of that. Um, so this, this technique we have now, this eraser crumb technique, is what we're using routinely in our genetic analysis of parchment. Um, so it allows us to do sort of multiple 
um, techniques with the same sample as well. So if the conservators are winning or we can get and, and sample ourselves, we can generate enough arrays of that we can do both analyses side by side. So we can do the protein analysis. So as like I was saying earlier, this allows us to say which animals are sheep, cow or goat, which means when we can target the DNA analysis. So if we're interested in analyzing sheep, we can make sure that the protein analysis um, is being done first so we can see which sheep, which documents are sheep and which one's a cow and then target that. And then we then take the rest of the crumbs and use that for the DNA analysis. Um, and in Sarah's work, just interestingly for sheep genetics, she found that um, of all the legal documents she looked at, 99.8% are written on sheep. So she only found one goat and one calf in these legal documents. So it, it adds the weight um, to our hypothesis that the majority of these sort of legal documents um, in the UK are written on sheep skin. Um, and this is nice in our sort of nice then becomes a nice data set for this analysis of how um, British sheep have changed through time. So obviously um, we can only go back so far for partial, but it nicely overlaps this sort of middle ages to present day transition where we see um, this introduction of a lot of, um, this is from Ryder's work, um, looking at sheep follicle patterns and um, through time. So the early stuff, is, it tends to be in the, the, the the um, wheelhouse, I suppose, of ancient DNA and bone analysis, where the Middle Ages to the present day is something we can, can look at with a razor sampling and um, this a razor crumb technique of many parchment documents and obviously a physical sampling of parchment documents as well. Um, and this is where this, we, we think we're hoping we'll be able to capture this changing of um, from looking at how the breeds were formed, can we see that, but also how the selective breeding happened to the present day. Um, so to do that, we targeted, um, because we already had samples from York, um, we tar targeted a York parchment transect from about um, 1300 to 1900 um, using two sets of samples. So samples from the Borthwick archives, um, which was 100 samples, we, we physically we erased a crumb sample of 12 samples of those, which gave sufficient data to give high quality 1x genomes. And then the whole archives where we had 38 samples um, and 15 samples were selected to give high quality genomes. Um, so in our sort of final analysis, um, plus the two samples we've already previously published, we have about 29 samples. And this is just to say how they look through time. So you can see, and um, we have a very early sample from the Baltic archive, but the majority of the samples is between the 1500s and the 18, late 1800s. And then the two previous published samples I put sort of halfway between the time course. So you can see we've got a nice selection of samples now that cover a wide range of dates through um, Yorkshire sheep history. So we can use that to say how has the sheep genetics in Yorkshire changed through time. Um, something to say about parchment samples, not all parchment samples are equal. So this is looking at just the endogenous DNA again. Um, in the whole samples, we seem to have this problem around the 1700, late 1700s where the endogenous DNA percentage of the sample seems to fall off a cliff. Um, we don't know why this is happening. It could be that parchment's been made in a different way or just the samples aren't very well preserved. But we get, because these are cut pieces, we get nice high endogenous percentages for the majority of the samples, apart from these samples here, which seem to lose um, for some reason. So um, this is just to say that, that though we have this nice archive, not all samples are created equal. And sometimes you get these weird artifacts of some sort of parchment production or storage um, issues. Um, and then again, um, the Barthwick eraser samples, some are really good, some are not so good. So again, we wouldn't be able to sample these documents if we didn't use the eraser technique. We wouldn't be able to take samples. So you have to suppose get what you, you get. Um, but uh, if some of the uh, uh, a good number have an endogenous percentage greater than 20%. And these are the ones we sort of took to our um, 1x analysis. But as you can see, a lot failed. So um, though the eraser technique is gets you access to the document, it isn't a magic bullet. So sometimes you don't get as much DNA as, say, a cut piece or other eraser samples. But if you didn't have that technique, you wouldn't be able to access those samples in the first place. So that's sort of the trade-off we take. Um, and then just to say that also parchment, we're starting to see it has this this issue with preservation bias. Um, so in this case, um, you can see here we have um, a sample that's a cow sample, and this is a fast Q screen analysis. So it's multiple hits to multiple genomes and single hits to single genomes, which shows you the amount of repetitive DNA you're finding. So in this case, um, we're seeing um, in the raw reads, um, it looks about 90%, 80-90% cow, but then when we do filtering for removing this repetitive nature and high mapping qualities, it actually goes down to just 2% of uh, endogenous percentage. So um, parchment has this inbuilt sort of um, issue, I suppose. And this is pre-published data, so please um, don't take screenshots or tweet about it. Um, 
Um, yeah, so there's this issue that um, you seem to have this problem with filtering. So some samples have this issue where they, they tend to lose a lot of their endogenous percentage relatively quickly when they start doing any filtering. Um, and this is the, the, an issue we're trying to um, address using um, hybridization capture or some other techniques. Um, so at the minute, we're sort of in an exploratory analysis of our parchment samples. So um, what we have done is uh, um, projected them on the PCA of European sheep breeds from Kygis, and they all nicely fall on top of either, um, the majority fall on top of Scottish blackface and the breed. So that's, that's what Paul tells you what you would expect because we've got these samples from um, Scotland. Oh, sorry, from the north of England, quite close to Scotland, and they resemble breeds from Scotland. So that was a nice result. Um, we do have another sample that sits between the black-headed mountain sheep, um, but the majority fall across the Scottish black face. And then when we look at um, a, a phylogenetic analysis, we see the same thing. So our, both the York parchments from Hull and the York parchments from the Borthwick um, fall, form a clay with the Scottish black face animals. So this um, we're using to say we've now got a population of animals through time that resemble a modern breed, and then we can use to um, look at this analysis. So can we um, map um, the genetics of Scottish sheep or Northern British sheep through time using this tool. Um, and one of the ways we're looking at this, this is a very ropey analysis, um, and it's just sort of a first go to look at production traits is, can we use a technique like ANG-SD, which is designed for low coverage data to do say FST analyses between the time points to see if any regions of the genome that are selected are in different SST changes between um, early and late sheep. This is obviously um, this is Windows analysis, and this is a top 0.1% highlighted in red. But again, this is early days, so this is we're sort of gen we're looking at this um, data set now to see, um, comparing it to modern samples to see um, where can we pick out regions of selection in the genome, or is there other things going on in sheep through time? And we're particularly interested in looking um, for production traits. Um, and to say, if you're interested in this work and you want some more information, or if you want to look at um, some parchment samples on the web, um, if you go to the, the website of our project, which is ERCB2C.org, um, ERC which is the web page of the Beast of Crafts project, um, you'll be able to see some more information. We have all our sort of publications and sort of parchment, um, uh, sort of, yeah, parchment samples we have access to are on this web page. Um, and that's finally, that's the end of my talk. So my thank yous to um, everyone that I've worked in a few places at this, doing this work. So particularly the Borthwick because they're the ones who started the analysis. Thank you for everyone for listening to the talk. Also my colleagues in Ireland, um, in, in the Trinity College Dublin and in the University um, of Cambridge. And also I've been heavily funded by the European Union. So I've had um, a couple of um, postdocs as part of ELC projects, but also um, a Marie Curie project um, in New York as well. So um, thank you for listening. And also thank you for all the, to the, all the Parchman Prizes and the International Sheep Genomics Consortium for um, the data sharing and all the resources that are available for people um, to analyze and use. Um, and thank you for everyone for listening. Thank you. <laughs>